Welcome to Nano Matters, the podcast that explores examples of nanotechnology. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Here with me today is Shireen Aubert, the Dean of the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. Shireen, thank you so much for being with us today. To get us started, can you tell us a little bit about your research? Absolutely, and thank you, Lisa, for having me. The work that we do in my lab focuses on looking at various types of environmental contaminants and developing sensor materials that are able to detect them and distinguish between them. We're very interested in looking at the different types of chemicals that sometimes accidentally make it into the environment. And we want to have a better understanding of When we build a sensor, does it tell us that it's there? If you have a messy environment, as all environments are, how can it tell us if we have more than one type of contaminant or two? And so we want to be able to distinguish them, but we also want to be able to have signals that are really, really strong that enable us to understand how much is there, even if it's in an extremely small quantity. So how does nanotechnology play a role in your sensors? So we start out by developing molecules that are able to really bind tightly to a lot of these contaminants that are out there. And sometimes these molecules don't have a strong enough signal to help us build sensors that are going to be sensitive. So this is where nanomaterials come into play because the nanomaterials can be designed to be extremely sensitive and to be able to provide us with different types of modes of signal transduction. And what I mean by modes of signal transduction, we want to be able to have something that will throw out a signal to tell you that it's there. So you can have electrical signals, you can have sound signals, you can have light signals. So all these are signals that are really important in terms of reporting to us that we have something that we should be concerned about. And so nanomaterials, you can design them by controlling their size, their shape, their composition. You can really manipulate these properties in different ways. And it's really the beauty of being able to really take materials and really structure them atom by atom to give you the signals that you want. And when you combine these with the molecular unit, you end up with this beautiful system that can go out there and detect where these contaminants might actually be. And when it detects them, you get that signal in return. And so this is really where nanomaterials has really helped us in terms of accomplishing some of these goals. So you mentioned being out in the field and measuring in a messy environment. So you're able to take your nanosensors into the field and get a readout and not have to take the sample back to the laboratory? Yeah, so when I started my work and some of the materials that we were very interested in were basically pesticides that are sprayed into the environment. We all need pesticides to keep our agricultural lands pest free and to allow our plants to grow nice and healthy. The challenge that we were seeing that was going on was there was a significant amount of pesticide being applied into agricultural lands, and there was more being applied than what was really needed. And so what was needed was consumed, and then there was more left out there in the environment. And so trying to figure out, like, what is out there, how much of it is out there became really important. And at the time when we started our work, what we would see is people would go out to the environment, collect a sample, and then bring it back to the lab and use instrumentation such as mass spectrometers to be able to analyze what was actually out there. What we wanted to do was to develop smaller devices that we could actually just take into the environment to do that detection. And the reason is when you collect a sample and you bring it back into the lab and you let it sit over time, it can really change its quality, right? So you lose what you have over time because you're in a different environment, the temperature is different, the air is different in the lab. So you're changing that environment and so you don't really get the accurate reading. And so in order to improve the accuracy and really know what's out there, you really need to take your device into 
the location where you want to be able to detect what is happening. And so that's what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to build these small sensors. We wanted them to be sensitive. We wanted them to be selective. We wanted them to be reversible. And so we were able to build them, but we had to work with collaborators who are electrical engineers. So in my lab, we do a lot of materials science and and chemistry and nanoscale science. But in order to get it into a device, we ended up collaborating with an electrical engineer who was able to take these materials and incorporate them into these devices and give us the signals that we were looking for. And so that did allow us to be able to go out into the field and do the measurements needed and to be able to report that data. So can you talk about some of the challenges that that you and your collaborators faced in making these sensors and how you overcame those challenges? So some of the challenges, as I mentioned, is really dealing with the fact that there's so much in the environment and you're trying to make sure that the materials that you're making are able to continuously function. So that was a pretty big challenge in terms of just understanding how do we eliminate the false positives, right? Because when you're doing things in the lab, you're just dealing with one issue and and you have your sensor and, and it's nice and pretty straightforward. But when you go into the environment, there's thousands of chemicals out there and you sometimes you're looking for just one or two. And so you really need to make sure that your molecules are as selective as possible, but you also need to make sure that your device is not getting false signals because of whatever else is in the environment. So that was something that we really had to spend a significant amount of time developing. Do your sensors work on an optical signal that you record with a cell phone, for instance, or do you get an electrical signal that you can measure and determine if the target molecule is there? That's a great question. So one of the things that was really critical to us is to be able to develop a sensor that gave us multiple modes of signal transduction. And the reason for that is we were concerned that one mode, which is what you typically see, you could easily get false positives. And so we developed these materials to actually have multiple modes of signal transduction. A common one had fluorescence, which basically allows you you to see a change in color of this sample. But it was also simultaneously also allowing you to get an electrochemical signal. So we would build these materials so that they would possess both optical signals and electrochemical signals. And when they would come in contact with the sample that we were interested in detecting and they would form a bond with each other, that would lead to a change in that signal. And so when we would get two different signals happening, then we would know exactly what we had. We were also very careful about the location of where these signals were happening. So as the location varied, it also gave us information about what type of contaminant was actually out there. In some cases, it could be a variation with the wavelength. So that small variation allows us to be able to understand better what type of chemical is actually out there in the environment. And so it did a couple of things for us. It minimized the false positives. It allowed us to be able to distinguish between the different types of contaminants that were out in the environment. And then we also had the sensitivity, which was really important because if you have just a very small amount, you want to be able to detect it. Sensitivity is so important as you're developing sensors because if you have a small amount, that could be pretty detrimental to maybe someone's health or the health of animals that are out there or just the environment in general. And so we want to be able to really develop sensors that give us different types of concentrations to be able to detect. And so that's some of the exciting work is sometimes you want to have sensors that are extremely sensitive. And sometimes you don't want them to be too sensitive because you know you're going into an environment where there's just so much of it and you don't want to saturate the sensor that you have. So being able to really work with different devices to be able to incorporate our materials in there and to develop a concentration range also allowed us to be able to really deploy these types of materials for environmental applications. So what is the status of your sensors and where do you see them having an impact in the future? So technology transfer is so important and the whole idea of intellectual property, being able to take your ideas and patent them and to get them out there and develop them and commercialize them is is, is something that I think is, is so critical. 
as I was sort of navigating the faculty world, for my particular department, it was so important to get the articles out. And so I focused on getting the articles out. And the technology was something I collaborated with some of my collaborators to really get them into the devices. And so our collaborators who are electrical engineers have really been working in terms of like really getting these out in terms of commercializing them. They have actually formed a company. It's up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And so that company is one that has actually taken a lot of the technologies and utilize them in ways that really make the environment a little bit more easy to navigate. But in terms of, you know, thinking about our students and and the work that is being developed and as well as our faculty, I think being able to train them early in terms of technology transfer is so important because you just never know when you're in the lab and when that spark is going to hit and how important that could actually be for the communities that are out there and the communities that need to be served. So as a dean now, I I really encourage our faculty to think about tech transfer and making sure that the knowledge is being disclosed as soon as possible and that there's no compromise to the ideas that are being developed. Shireen, I just want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us and explaining your research and the application of nanotechnology and sensors Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? So when I started as a chemist, I was just so excited about just being in the lab and just getting things done. And as my career evolved and we started developing materials and really thinking about where are these materials going to be used, I found myself learning a significant amount by talking to farmers. And they taught me so much. And that knowledge helped me go back into the lab and rethink how I do things that would help those particular stakeholders. So I encourage every scientist and engineer out there of the amount that we can be learning from others. And it has really served me well as a person, but also in terms of thinking about my science and engineering work. 